because I realized I didn't I didn't know her and she didn't feel known. I didn't I had mm-hmm. never treated her in an other centered way. I didn't do things for her that were just for her. I, I started realizing that little things that I did often for her were to make me feel better. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Reclamation Podcast. I'm excited to bring you today's conversation with Tim Buttry. Tim and his wife, Linda, went through a traumatic event in their marriage. And in the process, he learned about the journey to disconnectedness, a journey that all of us are suspect to and how so many of us oftentimes fall in the trap of forgetting to be committed to the disciplines of what it means to stay married. You're going to love his vulnerability, his openness and how he shares his journey back to connectedness. It's my sincere hope that if you know somebody who needs to hear this conversation, you'll share it. And that through this podcast and through this conversation, God can do some amazing things out there for marriages all over our community. So without any further ado, here's my conversation with Tim. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Reclamation Podcast. I'm excited to bring you today's conversation with a newer friend of mine, Tim. Tim, how the heck are you, man? I am great, and it's good to be here on this beautiful day. I know. God really gave us something pretty incredible today when he uh, He drew today up. It's breezy, sunny. It's you know, it's uh, I feel August. Like I'm back in Southern California. This is Southern California yeah, it's perfect, weather. Yeah. So you're from Southern California. Why don't you tell us how you ended up in Dayton well, and what it is that you do? I'm actually from Dayton. I grew up in Dayton, but ended up going to California early on in our ministry. Um, about 1987, Linda, my wife Lynn and I and our two kids took off to Covina, California. And became the young adult pastors there at, at a church in Covina. From there, I got a burden to really plant a church. And there was a place in Southern California that was just growing out of nothing, literally nothing. It was like desert. And they were master planning this community that was called Rancho California. Mm. So I was doing some research, did a feasibility study, and just really felt like God was calling us to plant a church there. So Lynn and I went down. This little town that had one traffic signal is now like Orange County. Uh, so we planted a church and we were there for 11 years. And uh, so we've already established then that your wife is a saint. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> right. For her to do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> and take our two little kids with us. Yeah, how now, old were your kids when that happened? Oh, when we moved down there, the kids were probably... Like six and four. Six and four. Man, you're... Whew. Yeah, that's it. And so you planted a church and you did ministry there for how long? Uh, We were at, it was called, when we planted the church, it was called Temecula Valley Christian Center. We later changed it to Crossroads Church. Okay. And we were there for 11 years. Started in a living room with four couples, including me and Linda. Wow. And from there, we we took on a storefront and then we went in and did a a tilt-up, industrial building did all the work to turn it into a church and we were there until we left in 2000 and when you left in 2000 you headed back to dayton we did not we stayed in in that uh, southern california region that was when we birthed this ministry true relationships and i'll tell you more about that story how the pastoring ended and the organization of true relation true relationships began yeah that's what i want to hear because I, I i think some of the ministry that you're doing in true relationships with um is is so needed in our community today and and in our culture and in our right right at culture and community so how did how did true relationships get birthed and what is it exactly well how it was birthed was in pain like every birth. Um, uh, Lynn and I did not realize how much we had become disconnected over the 20 years of our marriage up to that point, from getting married, going to North Central University, Bible College, preparing for ministry, starting ministry, planting a church, raising two kids. Um, We just didn't realize the effect until uh, everything crashed. Wow. Um, and so in two, in early 2000, um, 
I was I had been going through a very serious illness. I was on a chemotherapy treatment. It knocked the wind out of me like I never expected. Um, I, I didn't even know when I'd be able to speak on a Sunday. I had to have guests come in and so on and so forth. Uh, and Linda was concerned for me, obviously, you know, sure. as, as my spouse. Uh, she sent out an email to friends and family all over the country. Just, hey, pray for us. Pray for Tim. Tim's really sick. It's not going well. And one of those friends actually had known this person since we were young teenagers. Um, this guy actually was a youth pastor under my wife's father's ministry. Sure. And was one of the groomsmen in our wedding. Yeah. Um, but this guy took the most interest in my situation, our situation, and contacted Linda often mm. to find out what, what was going on. Yeah, uh, being pastoral care. Yeah, I mean, he was on staff at a large church. Sure. He, I still don't know what all the motivations were, but nevertheless, long story short, um, at some point in those conversations, he told Linda that his marriage was over. Oh. And that they had been to counseling and that it didn't work. Yeah, and you, you used air quotes. Yes, yeah. I did. Sorry. Air quotes for counseling. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Well, and, and, and the work you do now, you have a clear opinion about what counseling I is do. and isn't, right? And, and what you do in counseling to get results. So there's, I don't believe that they couldn't have restored that marriage. But anyway, the point is that he didn't see that happening. And Linda told me about that. And we were both concerned. But what... We did realize what's happening that Linda was beginning to feel safe oh. talking with this person and wasn't safe with me. And I didn't know that. I, I didn't understand that. She never really had the ability to tell me that. Mm -hmm. But now I, I think I think that's a big that's a big statement. And so I want to ask you to unpack it for me just a little bit. Okay. When you say safe with him and not safe with you, yep. you're not talking about physically safe. Correct. I'm talking about emotional safety, about being able to be honest and be safe at the same time. For her to be able to tell me something that was maybe bothering her that she needed and that I would respond in a way that wasn't harsh or wasn't critical or wasn't defensive. So I wasn't safe for her. I, I did not realize that even when I would tell her something, that, and you can hear me right now. You yeah. can hear the passion and energy. Sure. And she told me that my passion many times made her feel like she was going to lose. Hmm. I was going to win whatever it took, my opinion, my whatever, and I was going to get that accomplished. How often does that winning and losing mentality begin to form a crack in a, in a relationship? Uh, it can begin very early on. I would say that it started probably about the second month of our marriage. We call it the, the journey to disconnectedness is what we now refer yeah. to. And we teach in our seminar called True Relations, uh, called True Intimacy. Um, so the journey to disconnectedness is really something that most people have really resonated with. It starts out with something that's going on for all of us, fatigue. Right. Okay, because it's just so easy to become business partners. Sure, I mean you got kids, you got a church. Linda was so concerned about our kids and their education. Our son Josh was starting to have some trouble at school. We didn't know yeah. what it was, but he would come home. We'd pick him up. He was dead silent. We knew something was wrong. Linda took that. This is this is my wife. She took that and she started a Christian academy at our church. Using all the Sunday school rooms that were used on Sunday only, she filled them up during the week. We had 150 students after the first year. And so there's a, there's a sense, especially amongst Christians, of, of righteous work. Yeah, yeah. Righteous Get work, her done. Righteous work for, this, for the sake of the gospel at the cost of my Everything. life. Exactly. And that, we didn't know we were doing that, though, Tony. That's the thing. It's like, yeah. it's scary when you think about what we were told we were supposed to do and be and everything that preceded that for us was modeled for us in previous pastors everything so so here we are you so know? you're in this situation and your wife has become safe with another guy yep and in innocuously says to him one day well you don't know what it's like to be married to tim and that was the beginning of the end 
Yeah. Not the end, literally, but the end, meaning we hit the wall. She, she began to open her heart to him, and he took it to the bank. Right. And so that's the part of it that I believe that he did know what he was doing, but it doesn't matter at this point. The bottom line was that Linda found something that she did not have in me, and that was very grievous to me. So anyway, long story, sh- a little bit shorter. Um, she really fell into deception. Uh, she tells the story about how she got a, a flyer in the mail to our church in the area of ministry that she was over, which was small groups, discipleship, adult education. And this uh, event, this, this seminar was in the city this guy lived in. Mm. And she remembers that day looking at that conference flyer and said, God, you are so good to me to let me go to a seminar in my area of ministry where he lives. You must want me to see him. That was the de- the level of deception that was, po- and I see it all the time. Now, so, okay, let, let me, because yeah. I, I think people are living in this world. I, I agree. And um, how, how do you know, how do you know it's not God? I mean, how do you know she wasn't right? How do you know it's deception? Because it was wrong because it was destructive, because it was a lie, because she was responding right. to chemicals floating in her brain. <laughs> <laughs> so, she, yeah, so what you're saying is that God would never want you to go against the vows exactly. that you make. A- absolutely. Like that. there's a, a natural like marriage and a covenant in front of God. Now, if, if you don't have God... Well, that sure complicates that, whether you have that value or not. But most people did stand before a, an altar. Someone, right, yeah. Uh, 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 typically, it's in front of family and friends at a church and made those vows. I, I ask it all the time, Tony. So just to be clear, did you say those vows when you got married? Like, till death do us part? Yep, yeah, uh-huh. Okay, well, let's just take that and run with it then. I mean, that's where we have to start. Okay, did you mean that? That's the baseline. That's it. That's it. And I found that most anything can be overcome if you're willing to fight for what you vowed from mm-hmm. the beginning. So and your wife sees this flyer. Does she go to the city? She did. She did. Spent five days with this person. And when she came home, I didn't know it, but I knew something was wrong. I knew yeah. something happened. She was a changed it, elephant in the room, oh, like it was, it was like it was huge. walking on eggshells everywhere you went. And that was the beginning of, of the drift that happened quite radically at that point for her. And yeah, so now you went from disconnected to torn apart. Exactly. And I I didn't know why. I didn't know what happened, but I knew something serious. So right. my intrigue came up then. And, and obviously, like most people would, I started looking. Yeah, you fished you know, around, right? I of course. looked in emails, and I was savvy enough on computers even back with the, the the DOS stuff back then and I I went behind the scenes I got into temp files and I found stuff that no spouse should ever have to read right that their spouse said to someone else and so when I confronted that then you know obviously things changed quickly and I went to my board and I said, I've got to save my marriage. I, 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 I need time. I can't. Yeah. Cause do... I, so at this point, true relationships, your ministry now had not started. No, oh, that's great. Right? Yeah. I was Cause still... it was, it was, it, now it was in, you're still planting a church. You're in crisis mode because your marriage is seemingly falling apart yes. before your eyes. It was. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, your wife has been ripped up, you know, ripped out of the vows of the marriage. Exactly. You're, you're, you're in a horrible place. Yes, but I was determined to fight for uh, our I do know you as a fighter. Yeah, there was no, th- that was a non-negotiable for me. I mean, I loved Linda. That that's the thing that was so concerning to me. It's like what happened to her? Why why did she tell me looking straight in my eyes and say you don't get it, do you, Tim? I don't love you anymore. Let me go. And I'd look at her and I'd say, "Hun, because I love you, I will never let go. I will fight till my death for you. Not that I would hurt you or or make you do anything, but I'm not done. Right. So buckle up. I'm going to prove to you I am sorry for whatever I did. 
that made you believe that I didn't love you. So, and, so okay, let, let me ask you this, right? Because I, I would imagine that there's somebody listening to this conversation who's, who's had their spouse come in and say something or who maybe, maybe on the verge right there. They're, I mean, you know, like we, we know couples like this. You and I both sure. know couples like I this. I deal with them every day. Every day. <laughs> um, how, how do you know? I, I, how does he, how'd your wife get there? Wow. Well, as I mentioned earlier, there's this model that we use called the journey to disconnectedness. That's how we got there. It started out with fatigue. We just did what we had to do. I used fatigue as an excuse for right. what the second stage is in this journey, which is irritability and insensitivity. Irritability and insensitivity. So I would come home. I had given all of my energy, all of my ability to these people that would come to lead the church, to train the staff, do whatever I was doing, and I had nothing left. So my, I excused and justified my irritability and worse, my insensitivity. I stopped paying attention. I stopped mm. being aware. I wasn't listening to Linda's heart or her words. Right. Because I didn't have the energy or whatever. So that started a decline, a disconnect that just seemed like normal life. We didn't know what was happening. But unfortunately, that left to the, that left led us to the next stage, which is aloneness. Oh. Okay. Marriage was never intended to be aloneness. God looked at Adam and said, it's not good that man be alone. I'm going to make a helper. And Now, you were married but alone. But we were both married, but alone, yes. Right, yeah. right. right. Yeah. right. I mean, this is even before. And probably more Linda than me. She felt it emotionally more than I did. I was distracted. I was involved. Yeah, I... you're doing the righteous work of the yeah. Lord. Yeah, right. and, I, and I just, I honestly thought, well, this is just what marriage is. I, I, I thought it was going to be better or different, but I was willing, I was willing to accept it in this condition that it was, and I shouldn't have. Oh. And that had to do with my lazy masculine heart. And that's a masculine thing that I often talk to men about in my seminar, Godly Masculinity. It's like, what, what was going on in my heart? How could I have missed all of this, ignored it all, excused it all, and my wife is literally dying on the vine? Wow. And I didn't get it. I didn't see it. I didn't hear it. I didn't want to know it. It was too much work. That's sad. So we both ended up being alone and emo then, emotionally. And pretty, we, we right. did things. Yeah, we had guys, vacations sure. with our family. I mean, we felt kids, normal. Right? You were parenting? Absolutely. Yeah. So what comes after aloneness? Aloneness after that comes um, arrogance and alienation. And Ooh, so man, I are... stayed in aloneness, but Linda entered that. She began to say things like, hey, I got to do what I got to do to survive. This guy doesn't care enough about me to even hear me, so I'm going to do what I have to do. So that arrogance is not like an an ugly, blatant arrogance that's on your face. It's it was self preservation. In her heart. It, yeah. Exactly, it was self preservation. So she believed she had to pre preserve herself. I got to do what I got to do. So arrogance and then alienation, then, man, we're talking, if aloneness wasn't bad enough, now we're alienated. Now we are completely incapable of touching each other in that place in our hearts that would make us and feel. And alienation well, is in the same step with arrogance? It is. Yeah. They're, they're one in the same, they, they happen at the same time. Arrogance and I alienation. I say, I got to do what I got to do, and I pull further away to be able to live. I protect myself. I don't let things they say bother me anymore. I stonewall. It just goes over the right. top of my head. Okay, I got to survive. So then what comes after that? The next stage is what we've come to refer to as adulteries of the heart. So you're not acting out. You you may not be, well, for men, they, they might be dabbling, quote unquote, uh, in pornography. Um, a woman is probably going to be doing things like fantasizing. Uh, what would it be like to be married to someone else? I deserve better. So there's this, this adultery of the heart that begins to take place. I, I'm not doing anything, but I'm wishing it or I'm thinking it. Yeah. And then from there, that's, I mean, the next step is super scary and that's addiction. 
Oh, uh, yeah. And so Linda went from fantasizing with this other person on the phone to actually f- fulfilling it by going to be with him. And then that was the that was it. That was the clincher. Her heart was completely undone. She now completely was, disconnected. She was addicted to what this person could right. give her. It was scary. I and, mean, and that's the chemicals you're talking about. Right? It is the oxytocin. Absolutely, yeah. The bonding chemical, right? Yes. Okay. And and spiritually deception. Sure. I mean, very serious. Yeah, the supernatural part of this deception. is legit. It is really it's scary legit. And she didn't realize that she was there. It all made sense to her in some crazy kind of way that, that this was going to be better. This other person was going to give her what she had been longing for. Uh, but when I looked at it from my vantage point, not just because I wanted to keep Linda, but I looked at it as like, this is not going to work ever. This is a, He's going to lose everything. Right. And it's going to be a mess. Then you've got blended family. You've got, oh, yeah, just... I knew right. in my heart it was never going to be what she believed it was. But I knew that I, see, I had enough background with right. being independent and rebellious as a kind of a prodigal son in my early young life that I knew that Linda was dealing with something that I had my own experience in. And so I, I had grace for that. Sure. I was like, okay, I, understand, I get what's happening here, but I'm not going to let it go. So, so they, is it uh, does does the addictive stage, the last stage, does it work a lot like um, I, in my own journey? I've, I've got six years sober, and so I I understand rock bottom. Yeah. Does it work in a similar way? It does. And so the the pathway to restoration and redemption is through rock bottom. It doesn't have to be. Okay. It doesn't have to be. Uh, you you never have to go all the way down this journey. Right. You okay? can you can you can you can ask for help at any point. Exactly. Right. And what I often tell people in seminars is that aloneness is the stage at which you can do a U-turn without any real damage. Okay. Aloneness. Okay? So so just so everyone knows, and, and we can put a link to this in the show notes. Fatigue, irritability, and insensitivity. Aloneness. aloneness. Arrogation and alienation. Arrogance and alienation. Arrogance and alienation. Adulteries of the heart and addiction. But we've since found, since the beginning, that was where it ended, addiction. That's all we knew because of what Linda's situation was. Sure. But as I started working with couples, I found that there was a final stage that was much more serious and scary. And that was rebellion. Oh. Okay, it's one thing to be addicted. But as you know, as you've already said, you can get past an addiction. Right. Right. But the, when you steps, go to yeah. rebellion, and unfortunately, I've experienced that. I, and what's weird, you know, Tony, is the time I've experienced it the most often was with ministry couples. One or the other mm. went all the way to the bottom, and they just said, screw it. I'm going to do what I want. And they were rebellious against God, against their spouse, against their family, against everything. Yeah, against they, the vows that they, they professed. Right. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Sure. Right. Yeah. So that's, I mean, when you, when you see someone get there, you know, that's, that's scary. And that con- concerns me. I don't give up on those people, even when they're at that stage, when I'm doing work with a couple and I see that potential, I, I, I still keep fighting. But what I tell them is I won't fight harder than them. Okay, what does that mean? That means I want them to realize what they're doing, come to their senses, get a grip, step up to the plate, don't let this happen, and I'm not going to give up on you. It's not over till it's over, but if you don't do something, I can't do it for you. Nobody can. Amen. So there's a, yeah, there's a choice. And and I hate saying that because when people are in that place, they hate being told, you know, just make the choice. (laughs) I realize it's not just make the choice. There's more involved, but there comes a point. (laughs) When you have to decide. You have to decide. So Linda has made it all the way down to addiction. She never went into rebellion, thank God. Yes. And um, you're fighting for the marriage. She's given up completely. She's trying to unload you like a sack of potatoes. (laughs) That's correct. Right? And so, um, you know, spoiler alert, you're still married. Yeah. Yeah. Take me from there. Take me. Take me there. Well, it was seven weeks of me fighting for her until we could get into a counselor. 
seven weeks, seven weeks to get into a counselor that that I knew could handle what it was that we were dealing with. Got it. So you were looking for somebody specific. We knew well, Cause yeah, you, kind of because you were in trauma. Yeah, yeah. We knew okay. we needed someone that could handle the crisis of a uh, of sexual sin of re, uh, of addiction to a relationship. I, I mean, I was I didn't have a clue. So what does seven weeks of fighting for your marriage look like? Um. Having Linda be sorry and sad and cry and lay on the floor and weep and then say, I'm going to go write a letter and tell him it's over and go into the room and lock the door and write a letter that I knew an hour later, there was no way this was a it's over letter. Right. And when I, when she would finish this letter and was going to send it, I said, well, hon, I, I need to read that first. You can't just... Send him something that I don't know what you're going to say. No, you're not going to read this. If you, I'm going to the, the mailbox right now. If you want to come with me, that's fine. But you're not reading it. It's like, oh no, this can't be happening. And so I'd go with her. I'd go to the mailbox. She'd drop it in, and I'd pray all night long. I had no idea what I could do. I woke up. I didn't sleep, but I got up at like 6 a.m., took the kids to school, went to the post office, and wouldn't you know it, the minute I pull up in front of the post box out front. The, the mail person comes out with the key to take out all the mail. And I just said, hey, we put a mail in here last night that shouldn't have gone in. Can I get it back? And he goes, what's your name? I told him, he looks, is this it? Hands it to me. Huh. It was that letter. And I, I remember going and sitting in the Best Buy parking lot and reading this letter. And I came up, I fell apart. Because it wasn't. It wasn't. It's over. It was, don't give up on me. I have to do this, but stay where you are, I'm. I'm coming. I, yeah, something will happen. And so, so, so then I'd go home and I'd tell Linda what I read and blah blah blah. And she would just get. She got angry. I've never seen her get angry. Like, That's against the law. She said, <laughs> "You're not allowed to do, take something out of a mailbox." I said, "I can if it's mine, and you're mine, and that mail was mine." Uh, no, no. Yeah, or like it's ours, right? Yeah, yeah. I guess it gets. Yeah, when you say it's mine, it's not like possession. No, mine, no, no. It's, it's, it's like, like, hey, we're we have the same last name. Yeah. yeah, no, I I can't let that go out. Sorry, I, I love you. Okay, so she would just, you know, and it was a constant. Oh yeah, Did she, she st- opened and closed three mailboxes at the at the postal box uh, post office, yeah. you know, to be able to receive gifts and stuff from him. Then she'd get feeling guilty or she would have anxiety that would take her out. I took her to the emergency room twice Wow! in seven weeks because of anxiety attacks, panic attacks. So something was going on inside of her that yeah. wasn't good, but she could not see it and didn't know what to do. She, she admitted she was addicted. So I don't want to focus too much on that because right. that's really not the, the, the big part of the story, but it's a scary part because it tells you how serious uh, addiction, how serious deception really is. And she got caught in that. So at seven weeks, we were able to go to a place in Colorado called Stonegate Resources with Dr. Harry Schaumburg. And we we spent 10 days there. Fighting for your marriage. Yep. Fighting each other. No, we wouldn't. We didn't fight at all against each other. It was never ugly or mean or harsh or any of that. But, but it, it was, was just, more just disconnection. Yeah, it was just like, yeah. are, are we going to be able to do this? And she was not willing to just jump back in because I had found this place or because this guy was convincing. She was not willing to do that. And so it was a real process. Uh, but actually, it was day five that God did a miraculous turnaround in our marriage. Uh, Some important features that preceded that, but nevertheless, I mean, it really started with me, Tony, which was the funny, odd thing to me. I was convinced. I remember saying to God, okay, God, uh, I got her here. You got to do something. It's it's up to you now. You got to, you got to fix her. You got to work on her. (laughs) That was not the way it went at all. God worked on me. So what, what is that? Yeah. What does that look like? Well, that was, that looked like him taking me back to the, probably about month two in our marriage. So at the beginning, yeah, we were at church. We, we were trying to find a church in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where we were going to school. 
And we'd gone to this church, and I remember that Sunday, I, in my mind, decided that I was going to see, oh, what a setup. I was going to see if Linda really loved me. Because my love language, I didn't know it then, but it's touch, physical touch. Sure. So I was always holding Linda's hand. I was always touching her. She wasn't. And I thought that meant she didn't love me. So I said to myself, I'm going to, I'm not going to sit next to her right close to where our hips touch. I'm not going to hold her hand. I'm not going to put my arm around her. I'm going to see if she even notices that and whether or not she reaches out to me. If she reaches out to me, then I'll know she loves me. That was the literal logic that I had that day. Wow. And guess what? She didn't. She didn't. No, because I'm sure physical touch isn't her it love isn't. language at all. Not at all. Right. And I didn't get any of that. But at the end of that service on our way home, in no uncertain terms, I unleashed my pain on her. Yeah. And, you know, I told her that she couldn't possibly love me the way I loved her. She wouldn't have missed that opportunity. I mean, selfish, immature, ridiculous. But I was truly angry. And I remember leaving our apartment that day and going and riding my bike around downtown Minneapolis for like three, four hours. And then when I came home, I walked in the door, didn't say a word, acted like it was all behind me. And you never talked about never it again. Never talked about it again. And so so you're you're in Colorado, you're at this retreat center, day five. I'm reading a book and I come across a a quote by Jonathan Edwards, where Jonathan Edwards prayed this prayer. God, if you if you don't help me, if you don't come to my rescue, I will not make it. And he said, when a person is thus humble, God is quick to rescue them. Mm. And it broke me. I was like, God, that's me. Did you did, when you read that? Did you just feel like God was talking to you right? Oh, then? absolutely! And I knew that I had to figure out something. God, you got to help me. I don't know what to do. And I remember beginning to weep and cry. And it was in a public kind of a. There were other couples. Yeah, it was like there. a day room kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, and yeah. we were just sitting in a chair reading. And I started crying so much I had to leave. And I went downstairs into the basement area, and I found a closet. And I went in and I laid on the floor and I wept and I cried. And God took me back to that day. Literally, I, I remember the experience as if God was talking to me, and, and it wasn't verbal, obviously, but it was in my heart. He said, do you remember that day, Tim? And he took me back to that Sunday in that church. And I said, yeah. He said, that's where it started. And that self-centeredness that day has been woven through the entire fabric of your marriage until this very day. And it rocked my world. Uh, it, you know, to somebody else hearing that story, is like, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, I don't know what it was for someone else, but for me, I understood exactly what God was saying, what He was saying to me. Now, do, you obviously, uh, I mean, you didn't get into the marriage and say, "Man, I'm going to figure out a way to, like, trap my wife." No. And so this, I mean, that. That mentality goes back before your marriage. How long did it take for you to kind of realize that that's, uh, I mean, wh where does that behavior come from? That's a good question. Actually, the way I understand it is it's in every single one of our hearts that we just refer to it as self-centeredness. Yeah. It's like, and I'm not talking about it's, selfish, or I'm not even. I'm it's not just even the human condition. It, it is. It's part of our fallenness. Right. Yeah. We would say like the fall, like the sin. The, yes. The epistemic consequence of sin. Exactly. Right. So we refer to that as self-centeredness, which makes sense. Be right. And funny thing is, there are things that we do that are self-centered that don't feel bad or wrong or negative or anything else. But it was interesting because we discovered things about us. During that time, that was very clearly self-centered. So we've learned that the way Jesus wants us to be is not self-centered, obviously, right. but other-centered. Now, that doesn't mean you're sacrificial all the time. It doesn't mean that you're selfless. That's what I think a lot of people get that confused. They say, well, I'm not allowed to be selfish, so I have to be selfless. Or they don't understand self-centeredness. And so then if they don't, then they automatically assume, well, they just can't be who they want to be. They're going to get stepped on. They're going to be taken advantage of. You yeah, know. this isn't about not getting your needs. Correct. Back. But we didn't understand that initially. Got it. So 
when we realize that it was about not being self-centered, but instead being other-centered. So it's what Jesus said, consider the other person more important than yourself. So I had to start listening to Linda. I had to know her. I determined I wanted to get a Ph.D. in LJB, Linda J. Buttry. <laughs> I, a and Ph.D. I in L- LJB. LJB. <laughs> Because I realized I didn't, I didn't know her, and she didn't feel known. I didn't, I had never treated her in an other-centered way. I didn't do things for her that were just for her. I, I started realizing that little things that I did often for her were to make me feel better. For example, um, like I remember, I realized at some point in our marriage after we had gotten re- restored that I, ne- I never really opened the car door for Linda. Uh, and I started evaluating it in my heart. I was like, well, why don't I do that? And I realized that one of the reasons, one of the reasons was because I didn't want her to take that for granted or to get used to it. And then I was just doing it because I had to or supposed to. So I had to ask myself, okay, am I, if I'm going to do this, then I need to understand what's really going on. So I, I went to Linda and I said, "Hun, if I opened the car door for you, like almost every time we get in the car, would you ever, would it ever get old? Would you ever get used to it? And I'll never forget Tony. She looked at me with those puppy dog eyes and she smiled and she said, oh, Tim, I would never get used to it. I would, it would never get old. And I said, really? I mean, are you serious? I mean, like it would never, it would never get old. And I looked at her and I said, okay, I can do that. And I have ever since. That's been probably close to 20 years. Okay, here's the question. Yeah. All right, I'm thinking about this in my own life. <laughs> yeah. How many times are you already sitting in the car waiting on her to come out? And then you do you get out of the car and then go open it? Oh, I would. That doesn't happen very often for me. But if that Got were it. the case, I absolutely would. Like in the middle of winter, often Linda would just kind of wave me off. No, you don't need to do it this time. And I would... That's the biggest opportunity for this. Is the this best. is when I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so you read the Jonathan Edwards quote. You yeah. you go on this pathway to, to getting a PhD in LJB, and yeah. and you're there, and you're, um, I mean, restoration happens immediately. Uh, yeah. Well, ish. Yeah, I mean the 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 new beginning happened very suddenly. It was it was in one session of our counseling is when it changed directions. And it was really interesting because when I had had that experience in that closet and God showed me that situation back early in our marriage, I remember I I left that closet. I went to our little uh, hotel room kind of thing. Linda was laying on the bed reading and I went up and I knelt on the bed, literally fell on my knees and next to the bed and I put my head on her lap and I wept and I asked her to forgive me, told her what God had shown me, that I was so sorry for how I had treated her and ignored her. And she sat there with her hand on my back, never said a word, never said, okay, never said, I forgive you, nothing. And I didn't know what to do. So I learned, I was learning anyway keep my mouth shut. (laughs) So the next day in counseling, which is hard for every preacher, by the way, for most of us. Yes, I think so. So the next day in counseling, we brought it up together. It's like, okay, here's what happened. And Harry Schomburg looked at Linda and he said, Linda, if what really happened to Tim was true and real, you only have one response that's necessary. And she said, what's that? He said, are you willing to open your heart to Tim again? That was it. That was the question. And she looked at him and then looked at me and she said, I can do that. Come on. I am dead serious. That's awesome. That was it. And that, it? that day we started going the other direction. Now, do you just take these same steps in reverse? I mean, how does the other, is there, is there a different pathway for the, the reconnection? I mean, uh, I mean, you've done a lot of research in this area now. Yeah. Is it, is it as clean cut or is it more like, uh, kind of just 
turn the lights off in the room and we're just going to keep bumping into each other until we figure out how to hold hands again. No, no, that, that wasn't the case. No, it happened. It, we were back to ground zero again oh, immediately. So, so almost like a brand new relationship. It was. With baggage. It, right. But it was interesting because we were both willing to learn now. So we realized we had both made mistakes. Sure. Okay. So now we're facing that and we're moving forward. So that's really where these seminars came out of. Well, so I started evaluating where we had been, what we make mistakes we made, and do other people make the same? So now, culturally speaking, she she messed up and you didn't. Right. Uh, how did you deal with, or did you have to deal with resentment in your heart about her sin? Uh, resentment. Probably not for me. It wasn't resentment. It was, it was more fear. Mm, fear of what? That it would happen again. Yeah. So that lack of trust. Oh, for sure. And that, that's what I found to be the, the biggest roadblock for people. It's not resentment as much as it is. Now, obviously, there are people, especially if they've been previously wounded, uh, sexual abuse as a child, et cetera, et cetera. Then resentment can be more profound. But typically, it's just, it's trust. How do I trust this person again? Everything I thought I knew didn't prove to be accurate. And so we had to change everything, literally. Everything had to change. Well, so answer that question, right? Because I I think that there are people who wonder if their marriage can ever get restored. And you specialize in traumatic and intensive marriage therapy, similar to what you and Linda did. Correct. That's what you do now. This is your entire ministry. Correct. Correct. In addition to what you do with the men specifically, but like when you work with couples, I mean, I'm dealing primarily with crisis couples. Now, our whole ministry is not doing that. Right. But I have other counselors on our team. We're dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. But but you specifically deal with crisis marriage. Yes. Uh, How do you restore trust in a broken relationship? Well, it takes time. So people have to be prepared to give time like it comes in little segments it's not big it's not like some big gigantic thing that's oh now i trust you it's it's little things and research tells us that uh research that's been done by john gottman and others identify that trust is rebuilt by a, a whole bunch of little things so it's coming home from work on time coming home when you say you're going to come home, uh, letting them know who you've been with and be honest. You're dishonest, it's going to completely set you back as far as that trust is concerned. So those setbacks often happen at the, at the front end. It happened with us. I remember I had gone to teach a men's event at a church. This was several months after we were back on doing great. Um And I came home and I walked in the door and I had that same horrible feeling that I had while the affair was happening. It was a dark cloud over our house for like seven or eight weeks. And I walked back in and I felt that similar feeling. It's like, oh no, what's wrong? What's going on? So I did what I did. I went and looked to see if I was right. And that day I found, I, I went to the phone. Lo and behold, there wasn't a call Caller ID from the area code this person lived in. That call came in. It wasn't her initiation. It lasted for less than a minute. I could see all that on caller ID. So I went upstairs. Uh, It was still like maybe 1030 in the morning. It was an early breakfast thing with men. And I walked in and I just wanted her to tell me what was happening in the day. What happened this morning? Hoping that she'd tell me. And she didn't. Oh. I, it's funny. I hear you telling the story, and I'm thinking, God, I hope she tells you. Oh, she did. Yes, it wasn't. It wasn't ugly or bad. It was the way that she operated, though, most of her life. It was protection. It was keep the peace. It was make everything okay. So, I knew what had happened, and so I said, "Hun, I felt that feeling when I came home. I looked at the phone. I I know that he called. Why didn't you tell me?" She said, Tim, I'm so sorry. I just, we were doing, we're doing so good. I didn't want anything to mess it up. I said, hon, what messes it up more for me is when I find out you haven't told me the truth. Yeah. So I need you to promise me from this day forward that anytime he contacts you, I don't care what form, 
anything, anything at all, please tell me the second that you find out. Hmm. And she said, I promise. And she did. From that point forward, it never happened again, and I knew everything that he tried to do. So how, how did she uh, get break the cycle with him post your time at, in Colorado? Uh, well, there was no more contact with him. So the, that, that break had happened just by the fact that we went to Colorado. Right. So ten, he knew we were going there, but he didn't ever heard another thing about what happened. Okay. Um, so that contact was over. He did try to... Yeah. intervene and i intercepted all of that along the way um, did you ever talk to him i did i did and uh the the first time i called him was the night i found out about what happened oh man yeah that i tell that story as a as a symbol or or an example of forgiveness you know what does forgiveness look like to me for me that night forgiveness looked like calling him so we, I found out what happened. Linda had confessed to everything. It was an ugly day. It was full of tears. Right, horrible, it was, right. it was just horrible. And that was on a Friday night. On Saturday, Linda and I were together with our kids, and there were still lots of tears. And I remembered saying, you know, hon, this has been a hard couple of days. How about if we just go watch a movie and get our minds off of this? And she said, yeah, that's good. So we got in the car, went to the, on the way to the theater. On the way there, she breaks into this horrible weeping. I mean, just just broken. Well, I was thinking, <laughs> she's so sorry for what she did, you know. She's crying. And so I pull off to the side of the road. I said, what's wrong, hon? What can I do? And she looks up and she said, I'm afraid that he's going to take his life because of all that he's lost since since yesterday. I said, what do you mean? She said he lost his church because I had called the church that night, Friday night. Sure. And I, and I called the pastor and I said, here's what happened. They went to his office that night, confiscated his computer, found all kinds of other things. Things. <laughs> and, and he lost his job. And his wife said she was done. So their marriage was over. So crash. He lost his, lost his job. He lost his wife. He lost his income. Lost it all. Yeah. Okay, so she says, I'm afraid he's going to commit suicide. And I said, what do you want me to do, hon? She said, will you call him and, huh. and make sure he's okay? And I said, yes, I will, for you. See, this is all a way to communicate to the offender that the offense is not going to make you stop loving them. Yeah. That is forgiveness. In my book, that's how forgiveness looked to me at that moment. I could have, are you kidding me? What are you asking? That wouldn't have been very forgiving or loving in my book. Right. Okay. So I took her to the theater, sat her down, went out into the lobby, and I called him. And I said, first thing I want you to know, first thing I want to ask you is what Linda wanted me to find out and she wanted to know if you were okay she was afraid that you'd take your life because of everything that's happened and he said oh tim first of all i can't even believe you're calling me thank you for being willing to find out he said but i would never do that i'm okay and i said good i said the second thing i want you to know is i forgive you i forgive you for invading my home for taking my wife away and i forgive you for that and I said, the third thing I want you to know is that I am fighting for my wife and I will win. And he had the audacity to respond to that. And he said, well, I don't believe that. I believe that she wants me and she's going to come back to me. And I said, well, we'll see. Come on. <laughs> I'm serious. That's incredible. I feel like that's like a Braveheart moment. Like, <laughs> you may take this moment, but you'll never take my wife. That's you know, exactly like, what I was feeling inside. Oh, yeah. so good. Yeah. So that's that's how that unfolded. And you know, and we went in and watched this movie. I don't even know what it was. It was I'm sure it was something horrible. <laughs> it probably was. And you weren't even. How could you even be focused on a movie? Uh, so we. Yeah. Oh, that's, I don't know. There's so many That's questions. That's all blur now. Right. Oh, gosh. How yeah. many years ago was that? That was almost 20 now. It was 18 years plus. And God has since used that moment to launch into this incredible ministry of of seminars and intensive therapy yeah. and, and all the things. 
I, I think that there's um, there's lots to glean from this. But one of the questions I have for you is, is there any relationship that's too far gone? How, how do you have hope as a couple that's in a broken and um, disconnected space? Well, boy, I, I don't want to oversimplify that because hopelessness is a very real thing and it sucks. And I hate it. Yeah. But I'll tell you this. If that hopeless person or couple are willing to reach out to a place like true relationships, that is an expression of hope that they might not even get. They mm. might not understand. But they're saying, I want to believe for something. And I don't want this to be over just because I have no hope. So here's what happens when they come to us. They get hope. I, I've, I've been told a hundred times they leave after one session and they tell me they have hope again. So hopelessness is not a, uh, what's, what's that term? Where, where it's a lost cause. Like if, you, if you're hopeless, it's done. Just give up. No way. That's not the end of the road. You just got to find somebody that knows the truth and let them give you hope. Stand on their hope. <laughs> right. I'm just going to borrow hope from the guy down the street. <laughs> exactly. Right. So I, I often, the first session or so is often me just giving them hope, telling them what I've been through, telling them what I've seen in others, hundreds of others that had no hope just like them, and they're thriving. So it is possible. So don't give up. All right. Let's fight for this. Let's see what can happen. And that's often enough to keep them going. So hope begins at realizing you need help. Yes. Yes. And that oftentimes they lose hope because they wait so long before they do anything. So hopelessness is partly their fault. Well, certainly because it, it serves the disposition the negative disposition, you know, in the in, exactly. the in the addiction world, we call it the the itty bitty committee in your head, right? <laughs> okay. Right. This I didn't know that. Stinking thinking, right? Stinking thinking. I know stinkin that. Stinking thinking. Um, the the committee in my head. All those things that say <laughs> right. that there's something out there that that I don't deserve to have hope. Uh, that I don't deserve to have, you know, really? like I, I've created this kind of. Well, you, you know, so so much of addiction is about getting to a place where you feel like you put yourself there. Oh, and so guilt and shame become the orders of the day. And, yeah. and, you know, like your wife experienced throwing herself on the floor and like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not worth it. Or, yeah. you know, right. all, all of that, the things that, that people that are in traumatized states say. Yeah, well, that's true. So, so a couple comes to you and they're in a, in a place of maybe it's infidelity. Um, maybe it's a, a an emotional affair. Maybe yeah. it's an addiction to pornography, yeah. uh, you know, now we're seeing it on either couple more and more, Correct. not just guys. Um, what, what, I mean, what's, what's the path? I mean, obviously you're doing this now and this is who part of who you are. What's the, <laughs> what's the path of, of restoration and redemption? Well, that's a, that's a big question, and, and I don't know if there are any easy answers. And I'm a bit distracted because there was something that I felt so strongly I had to say right before you started asking me All right, well, let's that. hear it. This is what I need to say to the people out there that have friends that come to them and tell them their situation, that they're done, their, their spouse had an affair, or they're having an affair, or whatever the case might be, and they don't know what to say and they think they're supposed to side with them. Mm. They think that's being a friend. They want to emote with them. They want to support them. That is the wrong thing to do. That will not give them hope. That will not change anything or make it better. The, what I want to tell people out there, whether they're people that are in church and they're, they have friends and then silently someone comes and says, hey, I'm struggling with this. Here's what you do when that happens. You make sure they know you will be with them through thick or thin. You will never give up on them, but that they need help. And you aren't the one to do that. 
Let the professional do it. Let someone who's been there. Now, a lot of pastors out there want to be able to help in those situations. But in my experience as a pastor and for the last 20 years, you don't have the time, the energy, the the background. Right, this is your full-time job. This is what I do. This is my calling. I am a pastoral counselor that God has set apart for coming alongside of marriages and families. That's it. So let let me, let us, let Christian counselors do what God's raised them up for Mm. and send them to true relationships if you're local. Send them, find some place, go to the Focus on the Family website, go to the AACC, American Association of Christian Counselors website, find a verified counselor that can do the work of changing marriages. So don't don't just side for them. Don't think being a friend means you've got to be okay with what they're doing. No, love them enough to let them know this is not the right. answer. Yeah, you've got to fight for the marriage. But you know what? That rarely happens. Right, no, because it's so much easier to just culturally give in to the the the, the easy way out. And it just adds Which isn't really injury. even that easy. Exactly. <laughs> I, I've never I met divorced easy. Like, it's never it, easy. Not at all. I mean, it's horrible. Right. So... Do them the favor of being honest and loving them through it and walk beside them. But mm. don't give in to the deception. Don't try to understand the illogic of them being in an affair. You can't, you can't do it. So just direct them to a place that will help them. Yeah. One, one of my favorite sayings is, is that if the only um, hammer you have is a tool, is a, if the only tool you have is a hammer, the entire world starts to look like a nail. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that yeah. one. And yeah. so, but but the, the, the truth is, is yeah. that there's so many of us out here and, that don't have enough tools. Yeah. Right? They, and so if you only have a hammer, the only thing you're going to know how to do is to, to hit the nail. Slam it. Right. And yeah. that's that's not what this is. And, and what I hear from your story and what I hear um, from your ministry is that there's there's other options. There are great options, biblical options, grace options that... that Here's what people ask me a lot is, can it really be better? Do I, am, are, are saving my marriage, is it just going to take me back to before this incident or before? No way. That is not my goal ever, to just let you go back to where you were. No, we are starting over. Everything's got to change. Everything's going to be new. You, you have to learn how to have disagreement, how to deal with conflict, how to love each other. What's their love language? How do I be other-centered? Everything. So that's what mm. started this whole thing of teaching people for us. We realized we had to do everything differently. We had to argue differently. We had to have conflict differently. And we didn't know any of that. None of it. That's kind of scary and sad. Right. The church is, and I, and I love the church. I do. I love the church. I even, I didn't tell you this part of our story, but they asked me to leave. Of course. And that was not fair, really. I was, it was, we learned more about life and love through that, that we could have been the best pastors we ever been, as far as I was concerned. Right. So we lost everything. We lost income, both of us, lost my car, lost our house everything. No. And I could have been angry. I could have been resentful of the church, but I wasn't. I'm not. We went found a church that we could stay in and grow in even in that stage of our life. And you're in the church now. And and absolutely are. Right, yeah, you serve here locally. We do, and our ministry is almost always in churches as far as seminars. So I love the church. Right. Um but the problem is the church is failing. Yeah. When it comes to speaking truth about marriage, about covenant relationship, about what makes relationship work. Uh, John Maxwell, I love John. And I followed John, when, especially as a pastor. I went to all of his sure. stuff, everything. Yeah. And I remember him saying over and over again, everything rises and falls on leadership. Well, it's not that I disagree with that, but I think that he's missing a significant piece. And that is that I believe everything rises and falls on relationship. Hmm. And without relationship, you have nothing. Without relationship, you don't have leadership. I remember John used to say, he who takes a walk but has no one following him is not a leader, but taking a walk. 
something like that. I don't think yeah. I said that right, but you get the idea. You know, if you're just take if you're just out and people aren't following you, then you're not leading. You're taking a walk. So it's all about relationship. And that's really kind of one of our themes at True Relationships is it's all about relationship, relationship with God. I mean, that's a huge piece of what we do at True Relationships. Right. Reconnect. Because if that's, here's what I found, Tony, what was missing in my relationship with Linda? I found that it was also missing in my relationship with God vertically. And I did. I never saw that either. Right. You know, it was like it wasn't until I saw what was missing horizontally with me and Linda that I was able to go, "Oh my goodness, I don't have that with God either." Wow. So that to me, that's the humility of God that He would let me find out something there. And a lot of people have disagreed with me on that. It's like, well, no, it's got to be with God first. No, no, it actually doesn't. What? Why is that true? Why do you think that? I. I don't know. There's no biblical reference that backs that up. I think God is humble enough to let me realize something in marriage that he wants me to really understand in my relationship with him. Uh, it changed my life. Certainly. Yeah, certainly. <laughs> I mean, that's happened numerous times. Yeah. I mean, you don't really understand a father's love until you're a father. Right. That's it? true. And, and there are kids, people that didn't have a father right. that don't understand God that need to find out some stuff. So that they can realize God is a good dad. Yeah. You know, and it's okay. So anyway, there's wow. just so it's much. So it, it's so good. It's so good. Multifaceted. And so the first 10 years of our ministry, we traveled. We just went church to church all over the country, just doing seminars. And then we moved here back to my hometown. My mom and dad were both in their late 80s. Dayton, Ohio. And we came back to be with them. Right. And we brought the ministry with us. And when we got here, God just changed it up. It became counseling. People started coming to me for help. Right. And it, was, it was weird. I don't even know how it happened. And now we've got our own counseling office, facility, multiple counselors, a, facility, a satellite office in Columbus. We're starting one in Cleveland in the next few months. I don't even know how it all happened. So the let me ask you this. If, uh, if a couple's in... Uh, struggle, trauma, if they're in a place, um, what's the best way for them to find you? Okay, I'd say the, the best first step would be to go to our website, truerelationships.org. Truerelationships.org. Um, we'll link to that in the show notes as well. That'll give them pretty much everything that we're about in a basic way. And now, if they want counseling, there's stuff on the, on the website that explains the different kinds of counseling. Uh, we talk about intensives. Not everybody understands intensives. I do four-day intensives that are five hours of counseling and processing each of those four days. So we're talking 20 hours of intense, get it done, and it, it's different than anything else I've ever experienced. You, you do weekly counseling, you do 50 minutes, you leave, you go away for a week or more, you go to work, you have problems and kids and blah, blah, and you come back when you come back, you don't start where you left off. Yeah. Most of the time, they've gone through something. Regress. They right, want to know what changed. to do with what happened. So we've got to fix that first. 20 hours of an intensive is like emotionally uh, deciding that you're going to juggernaut this thing. <laughs> That's right. And it's amazing what that does. Oh, I bet. And, and it's like six to eight months of, of weekly counseling. To, in those four days, you accomplish what we can usually do in six to eight months of weekly. So what if your marriage is not in uh, trauma? What if it's not an infidelity and, and you, but, but what you're saying is like, man, we might be, we might be in the beginning of fatigue or irritability and insensitivity. And mm -hmm. we may not, maybe uh, alienation and aloneness is just around the corner. Like um, how would somebody connect with you to avoid going to the next step? Um, I'd say set up an appointment with one of our counselors. And talk about it. And just say, here's what's happening for us. Right. We will know what to do. I've got one of my counselors is uh, specializes in a number of things, but EMDR, if anyone's familiar with that, uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting process, psychological process. It's called uh, eye, eye movement desensitization. Uh, yeah, 
forget what the it's R like is. a rapid desensitization, right? It, it, uh, it's a process yeah, it, that it helps physically a person changes take the brain. trauma from the front of their brain and put it in the back. Mm. So she's a licensed social worker. She does a great job with those kind of more clinical issues. Okay. My other counselor, Sue, is really really has developed tremendously over the last 10 years. So she's been on our team the longest. Wow. And she is now working towards some other degree issues, but she is just really nailing it. And mm. so she started out working a lot with women. So she just had a natural ability to understand a woman's emotions. She gets, every time she connected instantly with them. So not just women, especially now, but she's got a forte there that is, Impressive. I always refer women that are struggling with something I don't understand. Yeah. I see Sue for a couple sessions. So we've got a great team. We really That's, do. It sounds incredible. And if they want to follow you on social media, are you out there on the on the web? We are. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to remember all uh, the addresses. We'll, we'll link to them in the show okay, notes. Cool. We'll, find, we'll find them on, on your website. And, uh, and yeah. that's also, if, if you're doing seminars, which you do in churches, yes. if, you, if you're doing a seminar, you'll post that on your, on Absolutely. your, on your social media. And w in our new office, we've got a large Enough area space. for okay. meetings. We will be able to host, uh, seminars for about 40 to 50 people now. That's incredible. So yeah, lots of good stuff on the horizon. Um, and, and if any pastor wants to, 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 connect with you, the website to do that as well. And you can set up all sorts of kind of uh, host a seminar or send your people to a seminar or anything like that. I'll tell you what, here's what I'd prefer. If yep. there's a pastor listing out there and he wants to talk to me, I want him to email me today. Okay. What's, okay? what's your email address? Kim at truerelationships.org. Not, not Pretty right. simple. Yeah, too, too but right. I would love to hear directly from them. Let's Skip the middleman. Okay. Come straight to me and let's figure out what's going to work best for them. Okay. Good. Good, good, good. Last question I always yep. like to ask my guests. Mm -hmm. If you could go back, if you could go back and give yourself one piece of advice, maybe maybe uh, two months into your marriage. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And give yourself one piece of advice, hmm. what would it be? Stop thinking you know it all and listen. Amen. That'll <laughs> preach every day of the week. Tim, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank dude. you so much for being here today. Thank you for sharing. And I cannot wait to see what God does with your Me relationships. Too, buddy. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my conversation with Tim. I know some of the things that I found so incredible was Tim's vulnerability and his willingness to share the pathway or the journey to disconnectedness. I realize that there are people listening to this conversation right now who are wondering about their own marriage. And if that's you, I just want to give you a little bit of hope. Everything can be fixed if you're willing to put in the work. So don't be afraid to reach out to Tim. Don't be afraid to reach out to me. Um, uh, don't be afraid to share this episode with maybe somebody who might need to hear a little bit about hope in their marriage. So thank you. Thank you for taking the time to listen. It would mean a great deal to me if you would leave a review and share this podcast wherever it is you listen uh, to podcasts. And our next episode, be coming up next week, is with uh, an old friend and a, a familiar friend to many of you. Nick and Lindsay Cunningham. They share their journey about planning a new church and uh, what they hope Emmaus will be. I'm excited to bring you this conversation. Until then, we'll see you guys real soon.